Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. Thank you very much. It's been an awesome conference. I really believe in my heart that you're going to go home and that this has started something on the inside of you or either just furthered you along in the process. But everyone here is going to go home and start seeing God's will come to pass in your life. And that's going to affect not only you, but thousands and thousands of people. So for the hundreds that are here, I believe that this will grow into thousands and thousands. It'll be awesome. You know, I uh, was uh, listening to something. Anyway, I, I listened to so much stuff I forget. But anyway, they were talking about uh, when the Mayflower came over, that this one guy fell overboard and uh, they had a rope trailing behind. I think that was David Barton made programs with me on Monday. We made two weeks worth of programs for Thanksgiving. And that's what they were talking about. And this man fell overboard. And uh, the sea was really rough and they would have just left him. But for some reason, there was a rope trailing behind the ship. And he got it and rescued. And they said he was a really committed Christian. And they gave all of the people that are his descendants. And I mean, they nearly every one of them are famous people that you know. I mean, both of the Bushes, President Bushes, were his descendants, the Baldwins and uh, Alec and Steve Baldwin and on and on. And there was like 20 or 30 people that every one of us know that were his descendants. And my point is that just look at the ripple effect of one life and how it's gone on for generations. And who knows what the ripple effect of what God has done here this week is going to be. It's not just touching these lives that are here, but it's going to touch many, many lives. And, and we, we don't know all that God has done, but I just know by the spirit that it was good and that it's going to be awesome. And so I've really been blessed. I want to thank once again, our praise and worship group. I don't see any of them. They may be gone someplace. But I tell you what, I so appreciate them. They don't just get up here and sing and entertain us. They worship the Lord and I, that's just priceless. It's awesome. So thanks to Dwayne and Sue for being with us. I tell you, Dwayne's a blessing. Amen. I just, I love Dwayne and his ministry. It's awesome. I want to be like Dwayne when I grow up. <laughs> Let's turn over to Acts chapter 7. And there's so much that I would love to share with you. And we just, you know, are running out of time. Again, I would encourage you to please take the time to read that book on how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will that we gave as a gift when you registered. And it's really important. I, that used to be three separate teachings. And I put them all into one because it's one thing to find God's will, but then you have to learn how to follow God and walk with Him to accomplish God's will. And then you have to finish. You know, it's easy to start. Finishing is the hard part. Finishing well is the hard part. And there's so many people that don't do that. And so to really see the fullness of God come to pass in your life, you have to learn how to find, follow, and fulfill God's will. And the scriptures over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 11, it talks about how that all of the things that happened in the Old Testament were written for our learning so that we through them might learn not what not to do and what to do. And I have lived vicariously through the people in scripture. And uh, one of the lessons that I've learned is from Moses. And I want to share that with you about how he knew God's will for his life, but he leaned unto his own understanding, trying to bring it to pass and caused himself and the children of Israel tremendous grief because he didn't do it God's way. And this goes back to the very first point that I was making that you, God's will is really for you to be a living sacrifice and unless you do that, if somehow or another you, fight, you stumble onto what his vocation for you is, or as Dwayne was saying, the, the secondary purpose and thing, and if you, if you find those things, but if you aren't a living sacrifice and if you aren't yielded to God, you'll blow the whole thing. And Moses is a great example of this. So in Acts chapter 7, I'm going to use these verses because there's things said here in Acts chapter 7 about Moses that aren't revealed over in Exodus 
And also you have to put Hebrews chapter 11 with this to get the full impact of what was actually happening with Moses. These people were inspired by God. Matter of fact, Acts chapter 7 is where Stephen was giving a defense of what he was preaching before the Sanhedrin and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he literally saw the heavens open and Jesus standing at the Father's right hand when all other scriptures talks about Jesus being seated at the Father's right hand. I believe that Jesus literally stood in honor of a man, the very first martyr who was giving his life for the sake of the gospel. That's amazing. So anyway, my point is Stephen wasn't saying these things out of his own flesh. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he gave us some details about Moses that we don't get in the old covenant. And so this is really important. Here in Acts chapter 7 and in verse 30, or excuse me, this is verse 20. It says, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, did you know this is the only place in scripture that it tells you how old he was when this happened over in the book of Exodus? It doesn't give you his age. Now this is very, very important. And so it says when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Again, I'm going to have to say some things here because most people honestly are more moved by movies like the Ten Commandments than they are by the Word of God. I'm not against the movie, the Ten Commandments. I've got it. I watch it. I like it, but it's not all scriptural. And one of the things that's wrong is that in the movie, The Ten Commandments, Moses is just a nice guy who saw an Egyptian oppressing a Hebrew and he went out and defended him and he didn't have a clue that he was a Jew. He was just a nice guy doing this. This paints a totally different picture. God put it into his heart to go visit his brethren, the children of Israel. He knew he was a Jew. Matter of fact, if you were to go back into Exodus, you can find that Jochebed, Moses' uh, mother, is the one who actually nursed him. And in those days, they nursed their kids until they were at least two years old, sometimes three years old. I got a friend that was nursed until he was four years old in our lifetime. So anyway, uh, Moses was old enough to know and uh, have Jochebed tell him what you know his lineage was and things like this. So it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was uh, oppressed and smote the Egyptians. And look, look at this in verse uh, 20, what is it? Verse 25, for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now this is radical because this changes the whole narrative. When Moses went out to visit his brethren, he knew what God's will for his life was and he went out and was going to trying to accomplish God's will to bring deliverance to the Jews through his position. Again, he wasn't doing this clueless. He knew exactly what he was doing, but he tried to do it in a way that wasn't God's will. So this is really important that you understand. It's not enough to know what God's will is, but you have to learn how to do things God's way. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You have to learn God's way of doing it. And this is why it takes time for you to see God's will to come to pass in your life because none of us just naturally by our human nature Think the way that God thinks. He says, my ways are higher than your ways. It takes time for you to renew your mind. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. And Dwayne and I both have talked all around this, but we haven't shared with you that Romans 12, 2, the word transform there is the Greek word metamorpho. It's the word we get metamorphosis from. If you want to change like a caterpillar to a butterfly, that is transformation. It's the exact same Greek word that was used when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and he, he began to radiate light and his garments became bright and stuff. That's transformation. 
If you want to be transformed, it comes by the renewing of your mind. You do not naturally, by human nature, desire to do the things of God. And this is why it takes time for you to see God's will come to pass in your life. Not because God is slow, but because we're slow. It's the instrument he's working with. It just takes a long time to sharpen us and get us to where we can do something. And many people don't like that, but I tell you what, God is patient and you just need to give him time. You know, I, I could unplug right here and spend the rest of this morning making this point, but on uh, July the 26th of 1999, uh, the Lord woke me up at three, uh, I think it was 2.56 in the morning. And I mean, I was sound asleep and I just heard the words, the time has come. And it woke me up. I sat straight up in bed. Time for what has come? And I stayed up two or three hours looking up scriptures and doing things. And, and the Lord spoke to me and says, the time for you to start your ministry has come. He says, when you start on television, January the 3rd, 2000, that's the beginning of your ministry. And at that time, I had been in the ministry for 33 years. And he says, you're just starting. If you had died, you would have missed my perfect will for you. And did you know in hindsight, it's exactly like he said, that's when our ministry really started. That's All the rest of that time was preparation time. It didn't take God that long. It took me that long to respond to God and get, get to a place that God could use me. Now, don't misunderstand. I'd been on radio since 76. I had been ministering to people. We were seeing some good things happen. I'd already seen people raised from the dead, but I hadn't started fulfilling God's perfect will for my life until I started on television. So that's only been 21 years ago that I've actually been doing what God anointed me to do. It took time. And it's because I'm so dull. So anyway, you can put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's just the way that it is, amen. He supposed that his brethren would have understood and they didn't understand. And man, there's so much in this. I'm having to skip through and pick which things I want to share with you. But did you know most of us would have probably made the same mistakes that Moses made because he could have easily looked at his life. He was supposed to be killed and he didn't die. He survived and he survived in a miraculous fashion. His mother put him in a basket and put pitch on it and put it in the Nile River and just let it float. Then alligators could have gotten it. It could have drowned. All kinds of things happened. And not only did he survive, but he just happened to float right to Pharaoh's daughter. Now that's supernatural. And the Pharaoh who commanded all of the kids to be killed instead wound up raising the one person he was trying to stop and paid for him to be raised and gave him the best education. He was learned in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was second or third in command in the nation of, of Egypt. It would have been easy for him to think, this is supernatural. No wonder God put me here. This is how he's going to bring deliverance to the Jews is through my position. You know, secular history, I've actually read some commentaries and in secular history, not biblical history, but in secular history, Moses went out and conquered the Ethiopians and had the greatest military campaign in the history of Egypt and subdued all of Ethiopia and brought in more treasure and things than any other person had ever done. So he was a military commander. He was second or third in command. He had all of this clout. And it would have been easy for him to think, God, I can see why you put me here. You're going to use my position, my military might to bring deliverance to the Jews. And so he flexed his muscle and killed a man thinking that that was the way God was going to bring deliverance. It made perfect sense but it wasn't God. And I can guarantee you, your reasoning and the way you see things happening is usually not God. And yet this is something that we do. We get a word from God and we make a paragraph out of it. God, thank you for showing me what you want me to do and I can handle it from here. I got this. You are fixing to fail big time. 
And let me share with you over here. Uh, keep your finger there in, in Acts. I'm coming back to it. But look in Genesis chapter 15. This is where Moses had an encounter with the Lord. And he made a sacrifice and a smoking lamp and a burning flax. Or maybe I got that opposite. But anyway, they passed between the pieces. God made a covenant with Abraham. And here's what he said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15 and in verse 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. So God told Abraham, your descendants are going to be afflicted in a foreign land for 400 years. Did you know over in Exodus chapter 12, let me just turn over and read this verse to you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, after Moses finally did things God's way and brought the deliverance to the Jews. It says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, now in the, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass. This is not an approximation. This is down to the exact day. After what? If you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 17, I won't turn over there. If they'll put that up on the screen, it would help. But Galatians 3, 17 says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, that's talking about the covenant that was made with Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, where it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That covenant, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect talking about the covenant of law that was instituted at Mount Sinai. That covenant of law did not disannul the covenant that was made with Abraham in Genesis 15, 6. So it was 430 years to the day after the covenant with Abraham that the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt. Now put that together with Acts chapter 7. And it says that uh, if we continue reading where I was in verse uh, 25, it says that he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them and they arose and would have set, and he arose and would have set them at one again saying, sirs, you are brethren. Why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at that saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared unto him in the wilderness uh, of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. And I won't go through that whole story, but most of us know that this is where the Lord encountered Moses and told him to go back and bring deliverance to the Jews. So it shows you that it was 40 years after he had killed the Egyptian that he actually went back and brought the Israelites out of bondage. So if you subtract those 40 years from the 430 years that they actually spent in bondage, then guess what? That means that Moses killed this Egyptian 10 years before it was time for God to bring the Israelites out of bondage. He did not understand the timing of God. And again, major mistake that most of us make, that if God shows you his will, you get impatient and you think, God, I'm going to bring it to pass right now. And we just get oblivious to the God's leading and his timing. Like I was saying with me, it was 34 years by the time March, I mean, uh, January the 3rd, 2000 came around. 34 years that I had been in ministry before I actually started what God really called me to do. It took that long. There was a time for things coming to pass. And I guarantee you, I was frustrated during this time because I had a vision in my heart of reaching the world, which I'm now seeing come to pass but I had this vision in me 45 years ago. 
And it was frustrating not seeing it come to pass. And I was always trying to make it come to pass. There is a timing to what God is going to do in your life. And there is a way of doing it that usually is different than your way. Moses was going to use his position and his might to make God's will. He wasn't trying to bring evil things to pass. He was trying to bring good things to pass. But through his own might and through his own power. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, it takes time to get that self-will, that selfishness, self-confidence out of us to the point that we can do what God called us to do. Did you know if Moses would have cooled his jets and have waited 10 years, let's just say that he knew the prophecy. I believe he did know the prophecy because like here in, in um, Exodus chapter 12, verse 40, guess who wrote Exodus chapter 12, verse 40? That was Moses. And it says, on the exact same day, the self same day they came out, he knew the prophecy. I believe that the Jews, man, they were marking time. They were counting time and they were looking forward to this. So I believe that he knew the prophecy, but he could have rationalized it and said, but you know, man, let's just say that there was 100,000 Jews dying a year. We don't know how many died per year, but let's say that there was 100,000 Jews that died per year in slavery. And if he says, if I wait 10 years, then that is going to be a million Jews that are going to die in slavery with their prayers unanswered. And I'm already here and I've already got all of this clout and I've got this power. I'm going to do it now. He could have rationalized and that could have been the way he thought. But you know what you miss when you do that is how many Jews died during 30 years extra bondage that wasn't God's will because of his disobedience? Just use the same figure. Again, this is totally made up and supposed, but let's say that 100,000 died per year over 30 years, then that would be 3 million Jews. It's probably much, much more than that that, were, that died with their prayers unanswered and looking at the promise of God like, well, it didn't come to pass. And their faith was shaken because of his self-will. Let me bring that into modern day things. How many people have been turned against the Lord because of some minister who maybe took the giftings that God had given him and he was a communicator and he became famous and he pastored a church or he was a media minister. But then because he was doing it his way, he wound up stealing money and being disgraced or he wound up committing adultery or something and the gospel got a black eye. And he could have thought, you know, but I haven't got time to wait and grow and let God do this. I've got to do it myself. I'm thinking of somebody right now who was doing good things, but got to doing it in his own way, wound up going to prison for a while. And I mean, caused a lot of problems. And I don't doubt that he's called by God, that he's anointed of God. He's still on television today and doing things, but he didn't do it God's way. And because of it, caused a lot of people shook their faith and things happen. It's not enough just to know God's will. You've got to know how does God want to accomplish it and when is the time. There's a lot of times that I have been tempted to try and kick the door down and make something happen that I know is God's will. And I don't mean this in a bad way. People think I run myself down. I'm just being candid with you, but I haven't got enough talent and ability <laughs> to knock the door down. Amen. If God doesn't open the door, it's not going to get open. And that's been an asset to me because I just, I haven't been able to make things happen on my own. I've had no option except to just hold on and keep seeking the Lord and hold on to the vision that God has put in my heart. But there are so many people that are really talented. And I mean, you're a great communicator and you've just got it all together and you've got all of this business sense and all of these things on your own. I pity you because it's, a, it's easy for you to lean under your own understanding. With me, I just, I'm not tempted in those ways. It's like, God, if you don't show me what to do, I don't know how to do it. Amen. And it's a real asset to be in a position like that. But Moses got premature trying to bring God's will to pass by 10 years. And not only did it cost the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage, but it cost him 
40 years in the wilderness that the Bible doesn't say was God's will. You'll often hear people take this story and say that God, you know, like if you saw that movie, The Ten Commandments, as Moses heads out into the de desert with his, uh, you know, uh, tribe of Aaron, row bone and a staff in his hand, the announcer comes on in this awesome voice and says, so Moses heads into the desert where scorpions and snakes are and prophets and they go into this thing that like it's all God's will and this was God's way of breaking Moses and bringing him to this person he was supposed to be. That was Moses' self-will that put him out in the wilderness for 40 years. There's no indication that that was God's will. Now God used it and God can use whatever happens in our life and there's no doubt that he learned some things but that don't blame God for being in the wilderness. God put him in the palace. He could have stayed in the palace if he had cooled his jets and had just waited on God and God could have done it. But it was his self-will that put him into the wilderness. It's your self-will that puts you in the wilderness. That's not to say that there aren't going to be problems and that there aren't things that you have to learn, but we make it hard on ourselves. We blame the devil for things. And I don't believe that the devil is responsible for everything that happens to us. A lot of times I believe the devil is taking notes from us and saying, man, I never thought of doing it that way. That's awesome. I think that the devil learns from us sometimes. A lot of our stuff is self-inflicted. And so Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness and I haven't got time. I'm having to hurry through some things. But in Hebrews chapter 11, it says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That word endure, if you look it up, that doesn't mean that he was like the movie, The Ten Commandments portray it, that Moses was on the backside of the desert. God, leave me alone. I want nothing to do with you. He wasn't running from God. He was enduring. That word means he was persevering. He was holding on to the call of God on his life and saying, God, I've messed up, but give me another chance. I'll do anything. You show me how to do it. I'll do it your way instead of my way. That's what Hebrews chapter 11, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. And when he left Egypt, he did not fear the wrath of the king is what Hebrews 11 says. Although Exodus chapter two makes it look like he did it because he was afraid. But the commentary, Hebrews 11, he didn't fear the wrath of the king he esteemed the reproaches of Christ, greater riches than the treasures that was in Egypt. He did this voluntarily realizing he had messed up and he forsook Egypt and he was in the desert regrouping. He was still seeking God. Man, I wish I had time to go through some things. But in Exodus chapter three, you see that the Lord appeared unto him and he turned aside. And after he turned aside, the Lord spoke to him. Why didn't the Lord just speak to him? This is the same thing that Jesus did. He came running out when his disciples were in the boat drowning. And it says in Mark chapter 6 that he would have passed by them. This is characteristic of God. God doesn't come out there and just solve the problem for you. God will present himself to you. He will make himself available, but you have to cry out. You have to make a demand on God. It doesn't automatically work out. And so... He, he did something unusual. A bush was burning, but it wasn't consumed. But if Moses hadn't have turned aside, if Moses would have said, Zipporah is at home fixing supper and I've been working all day, I'm going to go home. I believe that he could have walked right by this encounter with God. But when he turned aside, he, see, he was looking for God. This is characteristic of people that are really seeking God with their whole heart. They're looking. They recognize things that other people don't recognize. So he turned aside and God spoke to him. And let me just turn over and read this to you out of Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. There were four different times the Lord says, Now go down and bring deliverance. And Moses was a transformed man 40 years later. Prior to this, he got a word from God, made a paragraph out of it. God, I know why you chose me. Good choice because, man, I am this awesome person. I've got the entire armies of Egypt at my command. I'm second or third in command. God, I can handle it from here. He was self will Now, 40 years later, God is saying, all right, go down and bring deliverance. And he says, God, I can't do it. God, they won't listen to me. It won't work. Four different times, God told him they will believe you. And he said, they won't believe me. 
He was a transformed man. He had lost his arrogance. He had lost his self-confidence. And that's when God finally said, all right, now I'm ready to use you. You know, you don't find the beginning of God until you get to the end of yourself. That is an awesome statement. And it is the fact that most of us aren't to the end of ourselves, and that's the very thing that is keeping God from using us. Because if he used you, it first of all would destroy you. You'd get out in the flesh and you, Satan is going to come against you once you start being used to God. And if you aren't in Christ, if you're out on your own, you're vulnerable. You know, uh, one time I heard a preacher talk about going on a safari and they were in one of these things and it was an open deal. Didn't have a roof or sides on it. And there was like 10 people or so in this safari and going through one of the game preserves in South Africa and lions were right on the side of the road. And they were concerned about, you know, what's protecting us from these lions. And the guy told them, he says, the lions see you as a part of this vehicle. And they know that they can't attack this vehicle and they'll leave you alone. But don't get outside of the vehicle. And he told them that he says one of the previous groups, there was a Japanese and you know how they like to always be (laughs) snapping pictures and stuff. And they were right there and there were some lions and they were just totally ignoring them, eating some animal that was on the side of the road. And they said that this guy just stepped out one foot just to get a little better picture and boom, like that, that lion got him. And killed him the moment he stepped outside of the vehicle. As long as you are in Christ, you're safe. But the moment you get in the flesh, you are vulnerable to the devil. He can take advantage of you. And so this is one of the reasons it takes so long for God to get to where he can use us. Is because he's got, you got to come to the end of yourself. Moses had reached the end of himself. He was not that self-confident, arrogant person who God, I can handle it from here. He was changed. And look at this in chapter four. He had just told him in chapter three at the end of it that they are going to believe you and it's all going to work. And in chapter four, verse one, Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. He's talking to God. There's a visible manifestation of God, an audible voice. And God says, they will believe you. And he says, they aren't going to believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Now, before you read the rest of this verse, don't look at the rest of this verse. Everybody's looking at the rest of this verse. (laughs) But did you know Moses hadn't written this yet? When he threw that rod on the ground and it turned into a snake, remember for 40 years he'd been saying, oh God, give me another chance. He was enduring by seeing him who was invisible. He was seeking God. And here he was in the presence of God, the thing he had been looking for for 40 years. And when that rod turned into a snake, he was gone the other direction. He was forsaking it all. That's important because some people don't mind handling snakes. But Moses wasn't one of them. Moses was willing to flee the whole thing. And then the Lord told him to pick it up by the tail. If you are going to pick a snake up, you have to pick it up by the jaws, right behind the jaws so that it can't turn and bite you. Picking it up by the tail means that you aren't in control, that that snake could turn and bite you. And since Moses hadn't written the rest of this verse yet, did you know in, in a sense this was his... This was his final exam in Bush University. (laughs) 40 years in Bush University and God says, have you learned yet that you're going to do it my way, whatever I tell you? And he he says, pick it up by the tail. And so Moses picked it up by the tail and in his way of thinking, this was a death wish. There was no guarantee that that snake wasn't going to bite him. He didn't know it was going to turn back into a rod. But he picked it up by the tail and that's significant because that meant that God, I'd rather obey you and die obeying you than do things my way. That was his final exam and he passed. And guess what? When he did that, he caught it by the tail and it became a rod in his hand. 
And if you would have examined this rod, if somehow or another people would have been there to take a little sliver of this rod and send it off and get tested, they still would have said it was, you know, whatever wood it was. They would have analyzed it in the natural and they just would have looked at it and they would have thought it was Moses' rod. But look at this down in verse 20. After the Lord finally convinced him to go back to Egypt and bring deliverance, it says in verse 20, and Moses took his wife and his sons and set them upon an ass, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hands. Prior to Moses putting this down before the Lord, it was Moses' rod. It was Moses' stick. And all it could do, if he hit a rock, it would either break the stick or it would have jarred him, but that's all it would have done. But once it became God's stick, now he hit a rock and waters came gushing out and fed three million Jews and all of their animals. He held it out over the uh, Nile River and it turned into blood. And he held it out over the land and frogs and lice came up. He held it up to the sky and, and hail came out of a clear sky and fire ran along upon the ground. And he held it up and the firstborn of Egypt were killed. When you lay your life down, and then God says, take it up by the tail. You aren't in control anymore. It's not your life. It's not you living. It's Christ living in you. And you pick it up by the tail. Other people will look at you and think it's still your life. And they'll just see you and they'll think that it's you doing it. But you know that no, nope, it's not God. I mean, it's not you anymore. It's God. You know, Dwayne and I have been giving a lot of our personal testimony, but this is exactly what happened to us is when he had that vision, when I had my encounter with the Lord, March 23rd, 1968. Man, I laid my life down and picked it up by the tail. And other people thought that it's still me, but it's not me anymore. I'm not just me. I'm the rod of God. I've got God's power and anointing in my life. And there's things happening through me that you may not appreciate it because you're just looking on the outside. But I've got a covenant with God. And God has given me His power and authority. Same things happen to you. But you have to come to the grips with it. You have to come to this encounter. I could spend a lot more time than I've got telling you about steps that I've made where it looked like things were beginning to work and then God... I remember the first time in our ministry that Jamie and I were eating on a regular basis. It looked like we were going to live and not die. We could see light at the end of the tunnel and it wasn't a train. It was an exit. It looked like we were going to live. And God said, go to Pritchett, Colorado, a town of 144 people with 10 people in the church. I had 60 people in the church in Childress. It looked like we were going to live. And God told me to go to Pritchett. But you know what? That's what he told me to do. And so I did it. Amen. That's just like um, Abraham believed God for a child and then God says, sacrifice him. Everybody goes through this. Are you going to lean under your own understanding? Are you going to do things your way or are you going to do it God's way? And so I had to make decisions and I, I walked away from the first little bit of success we had ever had and went to a place where the only way to leave Pritchett, Colorado was feet first. There was not a stepping stone to anything. But you know what? That's where God opened up the ministry. That's where everything began to work. I'm telling you, the ways of God are different than your carnal thinking. And God is going to have to work on you to get you to where you quit leaning under your own understanding. You know, when I was in the army, it was terrible. And I mean... We had people in our unit get killed by the drill sergeants. They literally had one guy with a club foot and they, he couldn't keep up. And so the drill sergeant says, I want volunteers. I want the biggest, meanest, baddest people. And they volunteered. And he says, anytime this guy falls behind, kick him, hit him. And they beat the guy to death. He died. I know some people, oh, they don't do that kind of stuff. This was Vietnam. We were all headed to Vietnam. And they just treated us terrible. I could give you horror stories about uh, our trainee field sergeant that they took a, uh, entrench into a while he was asleep and beat his face in until they nearly decapitated him. And he died. It was bad. 
I was in a number of race riots. I'm the only white guy that survived. Every other person went to the hospital. I could give you some stories. Anyway, my point is that one weekend when everybody else was gone, I got one of the drill sergeants by himself. And I said, why are you doing this stuff? Why do you treat, you're doing things that are way beyond what has to happen. What is your logic? And this guy opened up and he says, you're a bunch of mama's boys. You're all, you're all wimps. And he says, we're sending you to Vietnam. And if we don't toughen you up, you're going to be killed. And he says, you may not understand it, but we are trying to help you by telling you that you got, you can't sit there. And when the lieutenant says, you know, move to this position. You can't all sit there and just say, all right, well, I don't agree with that. And he has to come and talk to each one of you and explain himself. We've got to get you to where you just do what you're told and you recognize authority and you respond to it. Now, I'm not saying that the way they did it was correct, but I'm saying there was a reason behind what they're doing. And, and it's the same thing in the army of the Lord, that we can't sit there and just say, well, God, I disagree with you. I think my wisdom is better than your wisdom. You got to get to where you obey and God is going to have you cast your life down before the Lord and pick it up by the tail. And he's going to ask you to do things that make no sense to you whatsoever. And are you going to lean under your own understanding or follow God? And so Moses learned his lesson. He went down to Egypt and used the rod of God and, and brought the mightiest nation on the planet to its knees. That was awesome. But did you know that it's not like you just one time do this, learn your lesson, and you're, you're that way for the rest of the time? Man, I'm running out of time. I'm just going to say this, but you can turn over to the 14th chapter of the book of Exodus and Exodus chapter 14. The Lord told Moses, he says, go camp in this place up against the sea. And there was a mountain on two sides, on the north and on the south. And over on the east was the sea. So it was like a box canyon. And he says, Mo, uh, Pharaoh will say, you're entangled in the land and he will pursue you. And I will give, I will get glory over Pharaoh and all of his hosts. So God told Moses what was going to happen. He had him camp in a place that would entice a military guy to think they're trapped. I can annihilate them because there's no room to escape. A mountain on two sides, a sea on the other. It was a trap. And he told Moses what would happen. And so Moses did it. Sure enough, here come Pharaoh and all of his armies. The people see it. They start screaming, let's appoint a leader and go back and become slaves again. And Moses stands up, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he has spoken over you today. Everybody says that's great. You know, the next verse, God says, wherefore Christ thou unto me, get up off your face and command the children of Israel to go forward. Moses told him, stand still. God says, tell them to go forward. And he says, why are you crying unto me? Get up off your face. I'm reading between the lines, but you know what happened? He knew that God was going to deliver him, so he made this bold proclamation, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And it stopped the riot. And so they were standing there looking at him, and he was looking at them. And here come the armies, and nothing had changed. And so apparently Moses fell on his face and began to pray, oh God, oh God, do something. And you know what the Lord said? Get up off your face. Take the rod and hold it out over the Red Sea. He had been given power and authority and he had fallen back in to, oh God, I can't do it. Oh God, do something. God said, look, you've got the authority. You use what I gave you. Hold that rod out and command the sea to part. See, you, there's a ditch on both sides of the road. You can get into this thing where you're so arrogant, you're going to do everything on your own. And that'll get you into trouble. But you can also get in a ditch over here to where, oh God, I can't do anything. God, I have to have you. And this is where a lot of people in the body of Christ are. They don't understand the authority that God has given them. And so they're begging God, oh God, please heal this person. He told you in Matthew chapter 8, 10 verse 8, you heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Peter and John on the third chapter of the book of Acts, they walked in and they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. They didn't even pray a prayer. They just commanded him, get up and walk and lifted him up. 
There's a balance. You've got to come to the end of yourself, but you can't live there. You've also got to say, I'm nothing, but in Christ Jesus, I can do all things through Christ. Some people just quote, I can do all things. No, you can't. But through Christ, you can do all things. You got to have these two opposites in balance. I'm nothing, but I'm everything in Christ. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. That's absolutely true. I believe that, but I'm never without Jesus. So therefore, I can do all things through Christ. And you got to keep these things in balance. And you don't just, typically, you don't keep it in balance all of the time. You tend to go from one extreme to the other. So Moses, after 40 years in the wilderness, oh God, they won't believe me. So he had this encounter. God gave him his rod. He went down and man defeated the mightiest nation on the face of the earth. But after he had come out, did you know sometimes when you come through your greatest victories or when you're the most vulnerable, because you feel, oh man, I can relax. And you quit being as dependent and seeking God as much. And so Moses was kind of relaxed and he wasn't using his authority and he fell on his face. Oh God, do something. And God said, you do something. Take that rod and hold it out over the sea. And then the same thing happened. Man, I'm out of time. But the same thing happened later. I think it's either Numbers chapter 21 or 22 where Moses had already struck the rock once and the waters gushed out and fed all the people. The second time he was supposed to speak to the rock. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One of them is that rock, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that they drank of that rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. So this was symbolic of Christ. Christ only gets crucified once. You don't crucify him twice. The second time you just speak and appropriate everything that he's already accomplished. So yes, that symbolism was there and I I submit to that 100%. But God got so mad at him because he didn't speak to the rock. He smote it twice that God said, you aren't going to enter into the promised land. Do you realize 120 years Moses had been moving towards this and because he broke the symbolism, God was going to keep him out of the promised land. I'm not saying that the symbolism wasn't there, but I think it was more than symbolism. It was Moses once again getting back into this, I can do it my way. It'd be more dramatic for me to strike the rock than to speak to it. And here he was uh, reverting back to that same thing that cost him 40 years in the wilderness and the children of Israel 30 years extra bondage. And if God hadn't stopped that self-will and stopped him from doing things his own way, it could have cost the children of Israel another 40 years in the wilderness. I'm telling you, you never get this totally figured out. I've had people come up after a message like this and say, please just cast this flesh out of me. I can't do that. The only way I can get you over flesh is to kill you and you go into the presence of the Lord and then you won't have a problem with your flesh anymore. But as long as you're alive in this life, you've got to be dealing with this thing about am I self-willed? Am I depending upon myself? And then on the other extreme, oh God, I'm nothing. How in the world could you ever use me? You need to live in between those two things. You need to keep these things in balance constantly. So it's not enough just to find God's will. You have to learn to follow God, to be led by God. And then I hadn't even touched on how do you fulfill, how do you finish your course with joy? All of that's in that book. And I encourage you to get it. But I think that we've sown good seed in you this week. And, and like I said in the beginning, we may not, you may not know everything right now, but you've got keys that will unlock God's will and everything that He wants in your life. And I just believe in my heart that there's some people right here that maybe you've known God's will for your life and you've messed the whole thing up. And you think, how could God ever use me? Have you done as bad as Moses where you killed somebody? And you spent 40 years in the wilderness and you're responsible for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people's death because of your own self-will. I dare to say that there's nobody here like that. If God was able to revive Moses and use him in the way that he did, you know, it's not too late for you. God can use you. And as uh, Dwayne has said, God's at least as good as a GPS system. If you make a wrong turn, it'll recalculate and say, turn back here. God can get you from where you are to where he wants you to be. I don't care what you've done. 
You need to take a lesson from Moses. Amen. Let's have our prayer ministers come up here. We're going to take a break, but I want to, I know that God is speaking to some of you. And if you're saying, oh God, I understand some things now. You need to come and just confess it. Talk to somebody and have them pray with you and say, praise God, I'm, I'm going to get back on track. I'm laying my life down before the Lord. And so I encourage you to do that. They'll be here during the break, so please take advantage of that. Mark, I'll turn it back over to you. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111.